obviously I want to make money. Yeah. Um, but I also want to be able to do it. And I can't, as somebody that's new, charge a huge amount and expect people to want to pay that when they don't know who I am. They don't know my level of experience. They don't know what I can provide for them. Um, so for me, my idea is like, well, I'm not in it to make money anyway. I want to just be able to do it because I love doing it. I love shooting. I love teaching. Um, it's just a good time. So I can charge less, make some kind of money, get people in the courses, get my name out there, word of mouth, marketing, all that stuff like mm -hmm. we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And then um, if it starts to pick up and I start to get more people sign signing up for courses, whenever that may be, then I can start looking at maybe charging a little bit more because then people like know what they're getting into. So they'll be more willing to pay a higher price for it. So, mm. Especially for you know my stuff, I, it's, I could charge a more than I am now, but with not having a home range or a home uh, place to do my stuff at, I have to use somebody else's stuff. So um, like when we did the defense pistol stuff, you guys still had to pay the $60 range fee. So if I'm charging $240, people are still paying $300 to even go to the course. Um, on top of uh, if they buy a gun and bring it, they have to buy the gun, or if they already have one, they have to buy ammunition for the gun, and that's not cheap. Um, so people are still paying $300 to $400 just to go to the one of the courses. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it'd be, it, in my opinion, it's more beneficial, especially for newer people, mm -hmm. to charge less, get your name out there, just sacrifice for a while, and Hope it works out to where you can get your name out there. People start noticing. You get more and more people, and then start raising your your prices up. So word, yeah. Well, let's backtrack a bit because uh, I guess where we're already going. We're just rolling, rocking and rolling. <laughs> so I guess uh, for one thing, I know we want to do is like let's say like who people who are watching this who want to get to want to get to know you. Let's just have a quick introduction. Let's have an introduction of who you are, Damon. All right. Uh, so I'm Damon Ortega. I live in Denton, Texas. I'm married, I have two kids. Um, my wife is Crystal Hankel, she owns Denton Sports Chiropractic. Um, I have two sons, Axel Ortega and Ryker or Ortega. Uh, my, my oldest is what, 24 months now, and Riker just turned six months yesterday. Yep, no, nope, two days ago. No, six crazy. months, two days ago. That's crazy. So they're getting big, they're a handful. Um, the, I work as a firefighter paramedic with the city of Coppell. I've been there for since 2019, I believe. Um, it's funny. I always joke around with people and you know say I guess it was uh, meant to be as a firefighter for me, mm -hmm. uh, just because um, uh, I was hired. Um, when was it? I was hired in March. I was with a group of guys that were hired in January, mm -hmm. but I wasn't finished with paramedic school. Um, I wasn't going to be finished with paramedic school till August. <laughs> And they were all done with paramedic school. Mm -hmm. So they all got hired in January and got a, I think it was a $5,000 signing bonus. And then I had to wait and come back in March. And I got hired in March, but I wasn't allowed to start shift until I finished paramedic school, passed, and then I could start shift. Mm -hmm. But my whole hiring you know, stipulation was pass paramedic school or you get fired, basically. Yeah. Or you don't work here. And uh, so I finished paramedic school in August. Passed the National Registry, um, first time, very easily, uh, apparently. Um, and then uh, September, I started shift. And my very first day on shift was September 11th. Oh, wow. So it was the same day as, you know. Yeah, I didn't know that about you, man. So yeah. I, I always joke around with people. It's like, I guess it was meant to be that I was a firefighter. <laughs> Not on that day, huh? Yeah, so I, I think it's pretty cool. It's, you know, so easy to remember. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, what so what led you to become a paramedic or a, a firefighter? So um, that wasn't originally what I wanted to do. When I got out of the military, I was a Marine, uh, was in the Marine Corps. I signed paperwork in 2007 in the delayed entry program, and then I left for boot camp in 2009, right after I graduated high school. Uh, I think I, gra I graduated late May. I left for boot camp and was at boot camp by June 8th. And then, um, so I was signed paperwork in 2007. I exited the military in 2016. Um, I originally didn't plan on getting out. Um, 
some stuff happened. Uh, I had done, a uh, little off topic, I had done four deployments in six years when I was in the military. And uh, most guys are lucky to get one deployment in four years. And I had done four deployments in six years. And it, 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 uh, it got to the point where I just wanted to be in the US and like be home for yeah. a little bit. And I would got, got back from my last deployment and I was getting ready to re-enlist again for a second time, um, getting ready to pick up Staff Sergeant. I was a Sergeant E5, I was getting ready to pick up E6 Staff Sergeant. And, uh, and uh, I had just held a Staff Sergeant billet at my last deployment as a platoon sergeant. And they were gonna give me orders. And my orders were gonna go back to Okinawa, um, to 3rd Combat Assault Battalion, which was my original uh, unit when I first joined. Because I, when I first joined, I did two years in Okinawa at 3rd Combat Assault Battalion, and uh, did two deployments from there. And the train of thought was, I don't want to go back overseas and live overseas. If it was a deployment, is one thing, but I don't want to live overseas and not have the freedoms that you know I'm allowed to have in the United States. And uh, so I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to change jobs from 1371 Common Engineer, which I was, to EOD Technician because it's close related, you know, uh, fields. So I tried changing jobs, lap, they call it lap moving, I tried changing jobs to EOD Tech, and I was about halfway through the process, got my security clearances, was almost finished with the process, and then they started talking to me and they're like, hey, there's EOD Techs in Okinawa because you denied orders to Okinawa as a Common Engineer. If you get this, you're probably still going to get moved to Okinawa for you know two to whatever years. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I was you know I didn't want to do that. That's why I tried lap moving, hoping that I would get a chance to stay in the United States, and uh, it wasn't going to happen. So at that point, I uh, took the option to verp out, which is early leave from the military. Gotcha. I think I was one of the last groups to be able to utilize that because they were still kicking people out for tattoos and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to utilize that VERT package and I ended up getting out uh, a few months earlier than anticipated. Yeah. So um, I ended up getting out March 2016 and I moved from there up to Denton to uh, apply to be a sheriff. And I applied for the, the, the department and everybody seemed to like me, seemed like I had a pretty good in for the job, just based off my background and how the interviews and everything went. And that's also when stuff with uh, police started getting pretty uh, hairy, to mm -hmm. say the least. Don't I like what's going on right now? Yeah. Gotcha. With everything yeah. started to build up, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I feel like knowing my personality, I wouldn't have been a good fit for that. Mm -hmm. um, who knows what would have happened if I would have actually joined, but, um, I decided to opt out of being a sheriff because of that, and uh, I was trying to find something else to do. And I actually went to UNT for a while using my GI Bill, and uh, was going into kinesiology. And that's also when I, uh, around the time that I met my now wife, Crystal, and uh, she ended up introducing me to her being a chiropractor and owning a business. She worked on a lot of firefighters in the area. Um, with her working on a lot of firefighters in the area, they all talked to her and you know, she kind of knows a little bit about it. And then um, she knew I was trying to find something to do because I personally struggled a little bit with um, what I plan on doing. Like I was thinking of going back in the military. I was thinking of going to be an overseas con security contractor because I had the experience, had the combat experience that they were looking for. I had the years. Um, uh, and that would have been a six month on, six month off type thing. Um, just because I was struggling personally with like being a civilian as opposed to being in the military, which I mean, you hear it all the time from most people. And I, you know, I was dealing with PTSD, anxiety and anger and all that stuff. And uh, she introduced me to a couple of firefighters and uh, they basically talked me into trying the fire academy. And uh, so I was like, all right, I'll give it a try. And then 2017, I joined the Fire Academy, NCTC. And that pretty much wrote the book. I mean, 
I went there, I was class leader from beginning to end. Uh, all the instructors really liked me. Um, I seemed to do really well at it and I liked it. It was very military-esque, which I'm sure you hear about most police and fire, fire departments, very military-esque that's derived from military style. Mm -hmm. um, so I liked it and it gave me some sense of um, brotherhood, I yeah. guess you can say, what I was looking for. And uh, yeah, that was it. I did fire academy and after I did fire academy, I did EMT, passed EMT, and then uh, started looking for a job. It's crazy, man, because uh, for the one thing I noticed that got me when you told your story, like she like sat down and told me, you're very aware like of what you would, like you said, like, I don't know how it would have been if I was a sheriff. So it's also telling me you're intelligent. Isn't an engineer like in the military, in the Marines, like a difficult thing to do to as well? Yeah, so I was a combat engineer. Yeah. Um, it's the only job in the Marine Corps that's does not have a chief warrant officer. A chief warrant officer is a quote unquote specialist of their MOS. Um, it doesn't have a chief warrant officer because there's so many aspects of the job that you can't have a specialist for the job. Um, there's two different sides of being a combat engineer. There's the combat side and then there's the support side. Um, on the support side, you're doing things like uh, construction, you still deal with demolitions like uh, explosives. Um, so construction, that's wood frame construction, uh, uh, concrete, uh, like making your own concrete, pouring concrete. Uh, basically anything you could think of like building up, they do that. And then you also deal with uh, vehicle mounted patrolling, uh, uh, mine detection sweeping, ID detection, um, ID improvised explosive devices for people mm -hmm. who don't know it, um, so bombs, and uh, some infantry tactics mm -hmm. because you're still a Marine, you're still uh, going to have to use combat if needed, mm -hmm. but you're more support side. So you're more on like bigger bases, you're on areas where it's not as uh, hot, I guess you could say. Um, hot as in like... Hot as in like... Uh, you're, the likelihood of you getting into a firefight is less likely. Gotcha. Um, but you still have to know all that stuff, right? So right. you still train and all that stuff. You still do uh, infantry training, infantry tactic training, um, but you're you're also doing a lot of the support stuff, which is like building up bases, uh, HESCO, construction, concrete, uh, concertina wire, barbed wire, like all that stuff that builds up places and support is more what you focus on. Um, and then you got the combat side, which is you still train that supportive side, mm -hmm. but you're more focused on combat elements. So you're more focused on the ID detection and disposal, you're more focused on uh, uh, weapon systems. Um, so you shoot a lot more weapon systems, you get a lot more f familiar with them, you do a lot more infantry tactic training, you train a lot with the infantry um, and uh, special units like SOFTS, uh, spe uh, special operation guys. Mm -hmm. Um, so you do a lot more combat related stuff uh, and that's where I went my first two years was combat assault battalion it's the combat unit in Okinawa um, and then in the states you got uh, CEB combat engineer battalion then you got uh, CEB on the west coast you got CEB on the east coast combat engineer battalion it's the, the combat units for the states really for the engineer side then you got ESB which is engineer support battalion Mm -hmm. So it's in the name. Um, like, I went to 8th ESB when I left Okinawa. Yeah. So I went, it was kind of funny, I just kind of went uh, a little down with um, the level of engineer I was. So I started as a common engineer in uh, CAB, went to 8th ESB as a support engineer, so I got both sides. Yeah. And then I went to get CLB, which is Combat Logistic Battalion, which now you're a, a still support engineer, but you're working with a lot of the logistics side, like admin, um, water dogs, electricians, uh, communications guys. Um, so it's more fully involved with everybody, yeah. as opposed to just engineers. And that's that's uh, interesting because that sounds totally different of now being a fire a firefighter and paramedic, right? Because I mean, you're saying either way, if you were, like you're saving lives, and it leads into this also because I mean, I know you because of CrossFit. We went to CrossFit Argyle together, mm -hmm. and we, we had mutual friends. We started getting to know each other more and more, and then just recently, like, what, like is it two years or one year now that you've started your self own self defense company? April, 
2022. 2022, so yeah. Almost one year, a year? Almost a year, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like you've had a lot of experiences right now, and could you let's tell me a little more about the uh, your uh, self-defense program? Like, why did you start it? <clears throat> so, Charm Defense is my company. Um, that's the one I started. Uh, it wasn't originally called Charm Defense, it was called DFW Tactical Defense and Survival. Um, but like I discussed with you, I feel like it was kind of rushed and it was uh, my first name, my first logo, and I kind of changed it up to fit more, mm -hmm. um, to be more easily said, and then a uh, better logo, um, something I can actually be happy with. Mm -hmm. So now it's called Try Arm Defense. So the reason I started Try Arm Defense was mainly because I have all this experience and I have all this knowledge, and I, I didn't want it to go to waste. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be able to do something with it. And uh, being a firefighter paramedic with the city of Coppell, I'm 24 hours on, 48 hours off. Uh, during that 48 hours off, I have a lot of time uh, with my family and I have a lot of time I could do something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to my wife and uh, I decided to start Triumph Defense because I wanted to utilize my skills and my knowledge to train uh, people to protect themselves, uh, people uh, to give people the uh, ability to save a life if needed, or save their own life, or save the family's life, or save the friend's life. Um, and that's really the reason I started it is because I wanted to utilize my skills and knowledge to be able to create more better prepared Americans in my community. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I you know. I didn't start it for the money. I started it simply because I love teaching. I love doing it. I love doing all uh, all the firearms, combatives, self defense stuff, and uh, you, it's just something you get when you you're teaching somebody and you see that light bulb flash and I'm like, oh, that's what you're talking about, or um, you finish a course and you know people really liked it. It's a good feeling, and um, I like knowing that I am doing what I can to save lives outside of being a paramedic firefighter because yeah. somebody may like people message me that have taken my course and like they'll send me a video of something crazy that happened and they'll be like this is absolutely crazy like i'm so glad i took your course like i feel more better prepared and aware of my surroundings to hopefully stay out of these kind of situations and i appreciate it mm -hmm. and it's messages like that it's like fuck it's like that's awesome because it's like you've given them a sense of confidence and a sense of uh, purpose in their life more than what they had before. Mm. And, uh, you know, we focus on medical knowledge. Me being a paramedic, that's a big piece because, like I mentioned, a lot of my, in every single one of my courses, it's, you're more, you're much more likely to encounter some sort of medical um, event as opposed to having to fight somebody or shoot somebody, right? So. If anything, that's why we always start with medical, is because um, you're, you're, I would like you to learn the medical stuff before you learn the other stuff. So that's why we always start with medical is before we move to any hands-on stuff or any kind of shooting stuff, um, because it's, it's so important that you know how to utilize trauma um, medical gear to stop the bleed, to you know, seal a wound, to you know, put a chest seal on, or um, to use a tourniquet, um, because, like I said, you're much more likely to roll up on a vehicle accident where somebody has hit somebody or you get hit by somebody and a family member or somebody else in the other car is severely bleeding because the glass breaks and, you know, severs their, one of their arteries or something or maybe not even an artery. They're, you know, they're just bleeding everywhere and you can't see the blood. Well, you've taken this course. You've, taken, you've, not, you've got the knowledge on how to use a tourniquet. And you've got a tourniquet in your car because I told you to get a tourniquet in your car and you listened and you went and got one and you know, oh, I can, I can do this, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to just being that deer in the headlights and like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And it, now they die or your family member dies or you die because you don't have that knowledge and the confidence to be able to, to, to stop a simple bleed um, with a tourniquet. And I've heard so. something like that with uh, the people. We, I think we follow some of the same people on on social media. Like I think it was Michael ever talked up said that too. Like more likely likely to confront someone with an injury that if you don't know how the medical skills to help them out, 
ra- they're going to die rather than people are I, I, I kind of want to say it's like Hollywood yeah. that people like oh I want to learn how to be a gunfighter I want to learn how to be John Wick yeah and you it's know? awesome it's awesome to be a gunfighter I mean that's bad you know it's badass to be a gunfighter it's badass to know those skills um, but at the end of the day you know me carrying my weapon on me is you know nothing compared to me knowing how to stop the bleed of a, uh, a traumatic event um, and you know p- some people might think it sounds exaggerated mm-hmm. like if you can't if you don't learn how to do this they're going to die but it's not exaggerated because you can bleed out in minutes like 3 minutes you're dead 3 minutes of uncontrolled blood loss you're going into shock or you're dead um, and what is uh, and that goes fast when your your heart rate's spiked, adrenaline's through the roof, stress is high. Um, you don't realize how quickly time goes. Yeah. And you know that's something I learned being overseas. Mm-hmm. You know you could be in an, an intense firefight, getting shot at, shooting back, um, IEDs are going off, and you don't realize. You know somebody asked you how long do you think that took. And you're like. Ugh. You know, five minutes, and you're there for thirty minutes. Like it, it time it time evades you mm-hmm. when your your adrenaline and your stress is through the roof, and you just don't realize it because you're just moving, moving, moving. Yeah, um, two minutes can seem like an eternity. Um, you know, I, you've, you hear everybody say that and it's true. Yeah, it's just one of those things you have to experience it to understand it. It's not on the same level as the stress you went through, but I mean, me just working out and we're doing CrossFit, a short AMRAP would feels like so long, and we look yeah. at the clock and it's only been like a minute, and we still have like mm. nine minutes left. Worst feeling ever. Yeah, so it's not the same, but I <laughs> yeah. know what you mean about that whole time yeah. of it. It's like it's kind of in everything. Like if you're going through something, it just seems like, I guess, what is the people used to say? Like time slows down, and it just. Mm. feels like that i guess it's, it's it science like it probably right on. the adrenaline pump yeah. in i mean i think of that movie from judge dread the new one where they found that drug that it just like you they take it but they everything feels go slow motion like a minute feels like three hours yeah and i, I don't know if that's just the chemicals that make you release in your body um whatnot but i was going to ask you though like i think for some people who don't know like what is sh- what is going into shock like do you freeze up or what like when you say that like your body goes into shock your body goes into shock there's two different kinds of shock um there's compensated and decompensated shock so shock is basically I'm trying to uh, make it Barney, you know, break down Barney styles. Yeah. Um, shock is basically your, your body's inability to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is natural, normal, right? So you are, your first level is, say, for instance, you sever an artery. Mm-hmm. You're losing blood. Your heart rate's through the roof. Your heart rate's spiked. Your blood pressure's dropping. You're going, you know, you're going into shock. But you're in compensated shock because you're, but your body is still compensating. Your body, you're still in an, in a space to where if medical intervention is provided, you have a good chance of, you know, making out of that. You know, I could, I could easily give you, you know, large amounts of IV fluids, some TXA, you know, whatever I need to give you to keep your blood pressure from dropping more, and keep you out of that decompensated shock. But mm-hmm. then you start moving into decompensated shock, and now your your body's basically losing its ability to take care of itself. So you're starting to to lose your body temperature. That's why you got to keep somebody warm whenever uh, they are in a trauma si- situation. That's why trauma rooms and hospitals are always so hot mm-hmm. um, because you got to keep the body temperature up because mm-hmm. it helps with clotting. Didn't know that. Um, so um, you got to keep somebody warm. But when you go into decompensated shock, now your body's losing its ability to take care of itself. So your blood pressure is dropping even more. Your heart rate's spiking. You're starting to have trouble uh, with re- uh, respirations. You're, you may start to develop uh, arrhythmias. I know there's a lot of things that happen, but basically, shock is your body losing its ability to take care of itself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That's when you are in a pretty bad, pretty bad situation. Got it. Got it. 
So let me ask you this. This is something, something that also came up. When did you, teaching is something that can be very diff, difficult to, it's a skill set. Hmm. Did you always like to teach when, you, like, you were as, like you say, like, did you decide to just decide you like, I like to teach? Or was it something beforehand where you're not always like this? Because some people don't like, they're like, not a great teacher. Yeah. But you actively seem like you want to go out and show people what you know. And I don't <laughs> yeah. know if you had a situation in your life, you were just like, you know what, maybe I feel like I should share my knowledge with people. It's a good question. Because I, I say, never... yeah, because for me, it's like, I've, I, I don't know when it happened to me because when I, I mean, we're about the same age, I would say I'm 32. And it's always been like the cliche thing for me. I study, I like to listen about human behaviors and things. People that say that something that's fulfillment in life is always teaching people. And I never really felt like that when I was younger, when I was in my early teens. And it was always like, kind of like, oh, I don't, why should I? I mean, and I worked in, in the movie, in the film industry, TV industry, and I was always afraid of like, man, if I share my, share them this thing, it might not be the same, but um, my experiences was like, oh, they're gonna take my job, or they're gonna like use it against me, oh, the, the secret sauce. But eventually I came to point where in my life, I think just like maybe recently, like maybe three years ago when I was 30, when I, like that third decade in my life, I was like, what's wrong with trying to help people? Mm -hmm. You know, what's wrong with that? Because I used to have that mentality is like, oh, fuck them, why should I help them out? And yeah. then I guess with the whole pandemic, it kind of made me reassure myself and be like, or rethink about myself. Like, do I want to be this negative, this neg part of this negativity in the world? Or do I just want to like, no, just if I can help someone out in some whatever way I can, like this podcast, obviously, stuff like this. I always want to do it, like see if people, random people come on and if there's something, a message that they say that resonates with someone else that's listening to this, and it doesn't have to be a big audience, mm -hmm. that'd be a, f a great way to form of help. So that's, um, I'm again going to the question I asked you, did you ever have a moment like you were just like, it felt good or you just decided like, let's do this. I don't mind teaching. I don't think there was ever, I don't think there was ever one particular moment that really just like blew up and it was like, oh, I love doing this. And that was like my turning point, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it was just kind of over the years, I realized it's something I'm decent at and uh, I just kind of built on it. Yeah. Growing up the way I did, um, I didn't really, have those opportunities to do that. Mm -hmm. I've always, I've always, I will say I've always been like the kid that's loyal and like helping people mm -hmm. made me feel good. Um, I was never very talkative. I mean, you hear it all the time from all of our friend group, like, and it, it's funny because people see, you know, videos I've done or um, they come to a course or you know, I am teaching something and even uh, people at work, like I'll teach something and they're like, who are you? Like, what? Yeah. What? Like they, their, their mind is blown because uh, I, I talk a lot more than I'm normally talking in yeah. everyday life. Um, I'm just, I've just never been much of a talker unless is there something I'm passionate about or I look really like talking about. Yeah. Um, same way you know me, I'm, yeah. when I talk about something There's, I'm into, yeah. I'll start rambling right off. But yeah, yeah. I, that's kind of that's kind of like what clues me in. That like, hey, you like doing this mm -hmm. because I'm I'm talking so much about it, and I'm I don't have an issue talking about it. Yeah. Um, if I didn't like doing it, I wouldn't have anything to say. Right. You know. Um, but. I don't think, like I said, like to answer your question, I don't think there's ever a point in my life that's like this wow moment of, hey, you're meant to do this or you like doing this. It's just kind of something that I've built on because I've noticed it makes me feel good. Or I, I like the reactions people give you or mm -hmm. the feedback. Um, and it's something I'm, I'm not horrible at. Like a lot of people struggle with public speaking. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we've talked about this. Yeah, that's one thing I, again, when you surprised me, you reached out to me and saying, hey, let me show you some pointers to how mm -hmm. to uh, navigate a conversation and be able to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. And that to me also was like, I didn't know that, I didn't know that about you. 
because I, I always joke around because I feel like I had a the more a first the, between you and Crystal. I think I knew Crystal a little longer because I was going out there and tr- and getting her to, to fix my back. And she talked about you, and she would ask me like, "What do you think of Damon?" And I was like, "I told her what you what everybody got." So I was like, "He's quiet," and she, she jokes around. It's like he's got that RBF, right? Yeah. I was like, "Yeah, yeah he does," but she she I know she loves you, and she says like, "Yeah, but he's a big softy." So that's, that's just to keep people at bay, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and the thing <laughs> yeah. I mean, pardon me, but I feel like you were a combat veteran, so you've seen some stuff and I'm not going to talk about it, but it's, it makes sense for me when like people have had a, like maybe a difficult life or have gone through stuff. They have to, I guess maybe have a, some kind of persona, right? Would you agree to like approach it in life now? Cause so, like, I mean, for the most part, most yeah. people end up being that way. Yeah. And that's something that I, w- I was curious about. Like I like to talk to you about is your philosophy, let's say like in life, cause that's something I'm always interested in. What is your philosophy on life? Because, I mean, you told me one thing that the biggest changes you've had was having your kids. Before mm. that, it, you seemed like you were a different person. But once you had, when you had Axel, you told me it, like, made you do, like, a 180. And that's something I think people would always want to be curious about, like, just that philosophy you have. Because you've got a great philosophy. You, you want to teach people how to defend themselves. You love teaching anything. If there's, if there's one, something you can help with someone in one way or another, you seem like you'll be content that they took something from it. Yeah. Yeah, um, growing up the way I did, like I said, growing up the way I did, I mean, I grew up, uh, my father left when I was two, I never, I never knew him, um, so I was with a single mother, a, a, bro- a younger brother, a younger sister, uh, I grew up in poverty, um, we never, uh, never really knew where we were living. And there were times where we were in one place for longer than usual. Um, but that lifestyle doesn't necessarily bring, you know, good things with it. Right. Right. So, um, I, my mom, my mother was a drug addict, alcoholic, and there's always people at her house, people I didn't know, people I didn't know. Um, they were always high doing something. Yeah. Um, and there are times they would have a party in the living room. I'd be sitting on the t- on the floor watching Hellraiser or something as like a six year old. Yeah. Right. I mean, Hellraiser is it? You know, a six year old. Yeah. I mean, you just I, you forget about your kid. Just let him sit there and watch TV. Mm-hmm. Just try to ignore the the shenanigans going from, on behind you. For me, it was Pulp know? Fiction. The scene where the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah. And uh, I mean, like I said, growing up in that kind of lifestyle doesn't doesn't necessarily bring along the best qualities mm-hmm. in people. I mean, I've, I've stolen, I've gotten in a lot of fights, I've broken into a lot of places, you know, I've done a lot of stuff I, you know, I shouldn't have, but I didn't know any better. I mean, yeah. there's nobody there to teach me. I mean, I'm, I basically raised myself outside of when my grandparents would take me away from my mom. So um, there's a couple instant, a couple years here and there where my grandparents would be like, you know, they'd let me come live with them. I'd live with them for a couple of years. And then I'd go home to my mother because she would be, you know, all better. And it, you know, wasn't all better. And then I would end up going back to my grandparents and live with them a couple of years. And then I think that stopped around seventh or eighth grade. Mm-hmm. I think I went back to live with my mom officially. And, you know, it was always, she wasn't on stuff, but, you know, I was also naive and just kind of believed her. And, yeah. You know, it that wasn't necessarily the case. Mm-hmm. So um, there was many times where we, you know, I remember her giving me baths in the ponds and the parks because we didn't have water or a house to sleep in. We'd sleep in hotels or motels. Um, we'd bounce around from friends' houses. Uh, we lived at her cousin's house for a while. We would have one house here and there. Um, I think the longest place we stayed in somewhere was, uh, it was a house, but it wasn't like a street house. It was like a, a back house that was in an alley. So there was houses on this side, there was an alley, and there was houses on this side, and there was one house behind all these houses that was on the alley. Mm-hmm. Um, we stayed there for a while, um, but uh, yeah, so I, was, I I grew up very angry mm-hmm. and hateful and vengeful and uh, 
it, it, it was always a part of me. Mm -hmm. And then when I joined the military, you're, you know, it just heightens it. Right. right. Because now I'm being taught how to kill people. I'm being taught how to do all this stuff. I'm being taught to hate. I'm being, yeah. you know, if you don't hate, you're going to die, you know. Can I, can I, I'm sorry if I ask this, but did it feel like home? Like, it felt like comf like you were comfortable there? Yeah, I mean, I was comfortable. I yeah. mean, I, I didn't have any issues with the military. I mean, it was pretty easy because mm -hmm. you know, I, I never, I grew up not having anything. Yeah. So me sleeping outside in the dirt on a training exercise was like, oh, this ain't too bad. Right. You know, whatever. It doesn't bother me. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the stuff that came with, you know, the, the crap of the military didn't really phase me too much because I never had a whole lot growing up, mm -hmm. right? So it made it, it made it easy to a sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, so the, the going through the military, you know, all this stuff is heightened, and then I, you know, I do all these deployments, and, you know, I start to develop this PTSD, anxiety, and all this anger, and it just gets worse and worse, and, um, and then I get out. I'm out of the military in 2016, and I'm taking all this with me, so I'm not, I, w I, I would say that I'm lucky that I, I didn't end up in my family cycle, right? I didn't right. end up on drugs, I didn't end up in prison, I didn't end up an alcoholic. Um, and that was, that was something that was a driving force for me is I don't wanna be like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna change this. And I'm gonna do everything in my power to change this. Change this, change my family name, basically. And uh, break the cycle, that's break, what I break, usually hear. Break yeah. the cycle, and uh, so, it was it was a it was a struggle and then there's actually so my philosophy on life up to the, you know up to most of my military time was um, don't let anybody fuck with you yeah and uh, I didn't and then there was a there was a specific point I believe it was on my first deployment where we were during a clearing up and up to this point I didn't like I was you know I don't fuck with me right like, we're fighting if you fuck with me and uh, I was just a hateful person and I had no real outlook on life mm -hmm. um, you know I struggled with depression uh, there's actually times in high school where I, would, I remember I'd sit in my room um, when we lived in Emporia I would sit in my room, I had a knife, and I was a chubbier kid at this time. Mm -hmm. um, backtrack a little bit, um, when I said I was raising myself, I would get myself to school all the time because my mom would be coming down off a high, so I'd have to wake myself up, get myself to school, and I would usually ride my bike to school. Yeah. And of course I didn't wear a helmet because there was nobody telling me to wear a helmet. So I'd ride my bike to school, and uh, I was crossing an intersection one day, and it was a green light, crossing the intersection, truck ran the red light going about 45 miles an hour, Shit. hit me, Ran me over. I ended up in the the back end of the truck. My shoes were off. Don't don't ask me how, but I didn't have any broken bones, no bruised ribs. Um, nothing was wrong with me. I yeah. I crawled out from under the truck. I put my shoes back on. I got back on my bike, and I was ready to go back to school. Yeah. And I I didn't know what just happened. This truck just hit me. Yeah. I wasn't crying or anything. Like I just wanted to go to school. Yeah. And. Uh, it was funny because the lady comes out of a quick stop and tackles me off my bike and like made me stay there. Yeah. And it wasn't until she told me she was calling the ambulance that I started crying because I was like, I don't want to go to the hospital. Right. I just want to go to school. Just let yeah. me go to school. And uh, but I ended up developing seizures because of that because I, I hit my head on the hood, right? Yeah, fuck. And probably on the ground too. Um, but uh, it took them a while to get a hold of my mom because she was you know, coming out off a high. Eventually, they get, somebody found her and got her up there so she could take me home. Um, but uh, I ended up developing seizures and then up to fourth grade, I was a pretty small, lanky kid. And then I ended up between the medication that I was given for the seizures and the lifestyle that my grandparents were giving me, where I went from, you don't know if you're gonna have food or you're not gonna have much food yeah. with your, your mother to um, being with your grandparents, you can have anything and everything you want. Yeah. Right, so I became a fat kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was a fat kid up until my junior year in high school, but in middle school, you know, 
bullying, you know, bullying's yeah. a thing. And uh, I I got bullied all the time for being fat, and I never had any friends. I never had any girlfriends. Like, um, I just wasn't happy. And I remember I was sitting in my room with a, my knife, and um, I would contemplate if I wanted to be here. Right. So yeah, it was a uh, it was tough, but you know I struggled with depression most of my life. So. Mm -hmm. um, my outlook in life was, I don't give a fuck. Fuck yeah. with me, we're gonna fight. Whatever happens, happens. Um, this, now, come back to this point in the deployment, we're on a clearing up, I'm looking for an IED. There's a, there's a wadi, a wadi's basically a canal. Okay, gotcha. And there's a tree line on this side, and we're coming from this side, mm -hmm. and uh, I was told by my sergeant at the time, Sergeant Rios, to go look at this giant mound that was on the other side um, to make sure that there was nothing buried over there or nothing like that. I'm walking around uh, the right side of it. I get around the mound and I'm sweeping with my mine detector and I'm looking while I'm sweeping and I almost get to the front of this mound that's facing the wadi mm -hmm. and keep in mind everybody's on this side and the, the mound is facing this way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking, and I lift my mind detector up, and I take a couple steps, and again, don't ask me how, but one of the infantry guys from way down the line, um, for whatever reason, that was supposed to be down there, was on our side. And somebody knew about this tripwire mm -hmm. before I did. And uh, he came screaming, waving his arms, like, stop, 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 like yelling at me, like, don't move. Mm -hmm. And of course, I froze. Mm -hmm. And I didn't move, because I didn't know what he was yelling at. And uh, I'm trying to look at the front of this hill, and I look down, and there's a trip wire running underneath my shoe. Oh, shit. And I'm stepping on a twig that is leaning on the trip wire, and the trip wire is just doing this. Fuck. Yeah. That's a movie shit, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I was at a... Sorry? No, you're good, man. You're good. You're good. It's all right. Listen, we can move on if you don't yeah. want to talk about this. <clears throat> no, it's, it's just one of those times where it's like... I think it was at that point where... If that tripwire would have went off, it was, there was an ID, yeah. a directional ID that was pointed towards that hit, uh, pointed towards the group of guys. Yeah. Um, it would have hit me. Mm. It would have hit three of my guys. It would have hit that guy that came running. It would have hit my sergeant. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's not the only, the close call, but that's probably the closest um, outside of not really knowing where rounds were going. Yeah. Um, the closest that I knew, um, something bad could happen. And uh, I think that was the turning point uh, for me yeah. as far as like how, how I'm going to live my life. Uh, to me, it sounds like you realized how precious your life was. Because yeah. like, when you're young, I know that you think you're invincible, you're yeah. vulnerable, and then when you have some kind of some instances where that happens, it's like, oh shit. Yeah. So people just people in general don't understand how precious life is. Yeah. And I didn't. I didn't understand how precious life was. I didn't understand what I wanted to do. And then, you know, this happens, and it's like. It could be taken away so quickly. Yeah, and n people don't understand that until they've experienced something like that. Like they lose a family member, or you know, it's usually losing a family member abruptly, where people are like, you know, this shit's real. Mm -hmm. It can happen quickly, mm -hmm. and you have no control over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many people waste their life away 
being too afraid to do what they want to do mm -hmm. because they're too scared of the, the consequences or the outcome or how people will think of them that they, they don't ever get to where they want, they don't ever do what they want to do and they live a life of mediocrity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of those fears and we've talked about it. Yeah. And, you're, no. and I will say you are a man that's, I know that you're like, I don't want to be medio mediocre. No. And uh, so I think that was my turning point in my, how I looked at life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's been good for me because I don't care what people think of me. Mm -hmm. Anybody that, you know, I don't, if I have something to say to you, I'm going to say it to you. Yeah. And if you got a problem with it, well, we're, we'll handle it, hopefully in a nice way, mm -hmm. but we'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, but you're going to know how I feel. Mm -hmm. You're going to know what I'm thinking. And anybody that knows me in our group can tell you the same thing. Yeah. Um, I agree. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't look at that as like a bad thing. I look at it as like, I'm, I'm going to tell you if you're fucking up mm -hmm. and I'm going to help you fix you. I want to be there to help you get back on the right path, right? Um, but I don't care what people think. If I want to do something, I'm going to do it. If, you know, some people in the world have issues with, you know, dads being affectionate towards their kids. I could give a fuck. Yeah. Don't say it to my face. But if you have a problem with me loving on my kid, loving on my son or whatever, mm -hmm. I don't care. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Because I never had it. You know, so that was, that was another, um, another piece was, you know, Axel being born. Yeah. You know, I had this philosophy in life is like, I'm not going to care what people think when I'm the most scared to do something, that's when I'm going to do it. Uh huh because that's when things are gonna happen. That's right. when I'm gonna grow. That's when I'm gonna have life experiences that I need to have and want to have. Um, but when Axel was born, up to that point, I never had a purpose. I was just kind of living life. You know, I was living my life the best I, the, the funnest and best I could, the most fun and best I could. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was, I was doing all this stuff, but then Axel was born it was like, well, now, now I have a reason to do this stuff. Now I have a reason to better my life or to um, do the right thing because he's watching me now. So it's like, yeah, it's something I still struggle with. I mean, there's, I mean any parent is the same way, right? They have good days and they have bad days, but I think he gave me a purpose. Mm -hmm. And then uh, tying that purpose into my life philosophy is like the most amazing thing ever. Because yeah. it's like, now I can live this, this life of being fearless and being smart Mm -hmm. and trying to change my family name and he can see that and we can you know I can grow but he can grow with me and yeah. so can Riker can grow with me and uh, I think it'll be I think it'll be a good thing um, but I mean I wouldn't be able to do it without Crystal yeah because she definitely is a big part from knowing knowing you now knowing you Closely yeah. and her as well. And she, she was yeah. a big part of helping me um, fight fight my uh, my negatives, I guess you could say, um, my anger and all this um, resentment and vengeance that I still have. Like it doesn't just go away. You're you're constantly fighting it, right? So yeah. um, when I got out of the military, I was a very angry, very you know aggressive person, and I'm still an aggressive person. Yeah, just differently, um, because she has is such a amazing and 
humble and caring and nice and bubbly person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say it to everybody. I, I was eighty. Yeah, like it's you know, black it's, and white between you. Yeah, it's such a huge yeah. difference, and you know, I'm not that person. Right. And um, <clears throat> she, can you say she, cliche she, like completes you? Yeah. Cliche. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, she she definitely has helped me um, go about things a different way and take a different outlook on certain stuff. And I'm I'm definitely a different person I was when I got out of the military, and most of it's probably because of her. Yeah. Um, and she jokes like, um, she knows it, and then she also knows that my style of life and the way I approach things has helped her because she's um, more aggressive with stuff. She doesn't let people walk all over. You know, she cares less about what some people think on certain mm-hmm. aspects, and. Um, I think we help each other in that way. But that's that's dope. That sounds like the ideal relationship anybody would want to have with yeah. someone they're with. Yeah. And yes, that's that's really cool, man. Because because I, I look at my, like with let's go start with you talking being a parent because I always like I'm not I don't have kids yet, but it's always curious. I'm always curious, and I don't want to feel bad when I ask this, but it makes me feel like I don't want to ask. But it's like. If I have kids, I want to be the best possible father I can be. I want to know what works and what doesn't work. And it's like, maybe it's just me because I overthink things. It's kind of like, if I had a kid, what do I want to instill to them? Well, kind of some of the same philosophy you have as in like your life. And I mean, I'm speaking because I know you, that's what I'm saying, but like, know what hard work's like. Know what it is to struggle. Know what it is to be happy. Know that, I know I agree with the whole like, if. If I have a kid and a daughter or son, I'm gonna show them affection, and I want to show them it's not a we- it's not a weakness to show them that it's okay to show to show my love for you. I mean, don't let like I agree with you. Don't let people walk over you, but I'll be like, dude, I, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I'm loving you. You're my son. You're my daughter. Yeah. So that's that's something great. Yeah, I like about uh, that. I agree with you on your kids, and I definitely show you share it on social media and everything. Like you constantly posting pictures of your kids, and that shows that you love them. Mm. You reposting Crystal's post pictures as well. It's yeah, I was like, yeah. and it's funny because I would have never thought again of you sharing those pictures because yeah. again when I knew you, you were like this uh, don't fuck with me attitude. Like um, just don't talk to me. But when, like we said, we talk to you, you're a, you're a fun guy. You shoot the shit. You know, you'll make fun of, like, some random thing. I'm like, I didn't know Gaiman had that kind of sense of humor. Yeah, it's a, yeah, I get that a lot from people is, I, you know, I have that persona and that, you know, that RBF, as people say. And, you know, it's a lot of people who just don't really feel comfortable coming up and talking to me yeah. um, just because they, I kind of look like an asshole. Mm-hmm. But, I mean... It's like with all my friends and you and everybody, it's, I just, you know, I have to, you just have to talk to each other. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people realize I'm not that, that asshole they, per- they perceive me to be, but at the same time, you know, I don't care to change that persona. Right. Because it also, you know, as much as it hurts me in that aspect, it also protects me, right? So people perceive me as somebody they don't want to talk to or they don't want to mess with more than maybe somebody else. And honestly, in my opinion, I don't think that's a bad thing either. And I'm not saying I'm not somebody to mess with. I'm just saying like that keeps people at bay more because I look like an asshole, right? So, um, yeah, like I don't want to fuck with this guy (laughs) kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And if if that's the the idea it gives people, then maybe that's the idea it gives the guy that wants to mug somebody. Exactly. I was going to say, because with your, your self, your company and your experience, you kind of want that. Yeah. Like don't, no, I I think that's what something you, I don't know if you said this, if you you did, but it sounds like I always hear, but don't make yourself an easy target. Yeah. Right. Like, and then um, that's, a big issue with people, you know, when they get mugged or they get attacked in the streets or whatever, um, is usually it's because they're an easy target. There's somebody that's easy to take advantage of. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've, I, we talked about it. The, uh, yeah, the, there's studies that they've done with like prison inmates, mm-hmm. uh, bad people that have done bad things. 
and they've taken a group of them and they've given everybody in the group the same video of regular civilians yeah. walking down a road, walking down a street in a normal city town. Um, and they tell them, rate these people on who you, who you would attack first mm -hmm. and give the reason why you mm -hmm. would attack those people. And they rate the people. Mm -hmm. And the person that they would attack is the one that's not paying attention, not situationally aware, doesn't look like a threat. Um, it's an easy target. Mm -hmm. um, they're slouching when they're walking. They're not looking around. They're not situationally aware. They're playing on their phone. They're you know, doing whatever um, makes them an easy target, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're like, well, why? Why did you choose this, this person as the hard target? And like, well, because of how they're dressed mm -hmm. or because of how they're walking. Mm -hmm. um, they're walking upright. They're looking around. They're not, their head's not in their phone. Their, their, their presentation mm -hmm. is somebody that knows what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes you a hard target whether you realize it or not. Um, and it's proven in, this, in those studies that you know, bad people look for people that are easier to attack because mm -hmm. I mean, they don't want to fight. Yeah. Right? If if somebody puts up a fight, then um, they're either gonna get hurt or they're gonna get what they want. Yeah. If somebody doesn't put up a fight, they're just gonna get what they want. Yeah. And which one do you want? Do you want to take the chance of getting hurt, hmm. or do you just want to get what you want? Get what I want. If I right. was on that end, yeah. Yeah. If you're on that end, so um, that's why. Being an easy target is, you know, part of the problem. And, and that's something that I know you promote, too, is, like, don't be a fat slob. Physically, yeah. no, even, like, train hand-to-hand, -hand, not just your guns as well, like, hand-to-hand -hand combat as well. Yeah. That'll make yourself an easy target, and that means taking the extra step to become someone better than you are. Yeah, because, I mean, for the women that, like, take the, the, yeah. the courses, I mean, you can look, if, if, I, if it was me... And then one of the women that were in my course, and so they they were trying to decide who to attack. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to go after the woman. But if the woman is well trained in hand to hand combat, combatives, self defense, firearms, jujitsu, um, just because she looks like an easy target doesn't mean she's going to be an easy target. He's wow. still going to get his ass kicked. Yeah. But that's why it's important for people that are perceived as easy targets to get the training that's required to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. um, because you may feel like you're not an easy target because you know you're a black belt in jiu -jitsu. Mm -hmm. you, You've taken many, many firearms courses. Maybe like years in boxing as well, yeah. Yeah, you've done years in whatever. You don't feel like an easy target, but between me and you, the bad guy is gonna look at you Mm -hmm. Because he perceives you as an easy target, not me. So he's going to go after you. He, he'll still get his ass kicked because you know what you're doing, yeah. hopefully. Um, but you need to understand just because you feel like you're not an easy target doesn't mean you are an easy target. Mm -hmm. So you still need to know this stuff because people are going to choose you over you know, somebody else that is yeah. less appealing. Um, I would and say, being being not a fat slob is yeah, part of that, right? Yeah. So if if I'm fighting somebody, if I'm overweight and obese, and I've never done you know a mile and you know I've never ran a mile or whatever, yeah. And I have to run away from somebody. Well, I'm kind not going to be able to. Shit out of luck. Or yeah. if I have to fight somebody for my life in a hand to hand situation, well, I'm going to be probably more tired than they are quickly. Yeah. Right. So being able to have the endurance and the cardio to fight somebody off longer than they can fight or run away longer than they can run, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, fitness is a big part of that and um, I've made posts about that and I've talked about it and um, that's a big part. It's a big part of my life is fitness and yeah. I want to know that if I'm in that situation that I, I stand a much better chance than you do. Yeah, that's something that John Danaher, uh, he's a, I don't know if you can follow him, he's a Jordan Ryan's like coach. Yep. He broke it down, I'm gonna butcher it, but he said like, whenever if it comes to a, a confrontation on the street, you have these factors to consider. Obviously the conditioning, mm -hmm. how athletic am I compared to this guy? Then we go into 
I mean, well, that's the, condi- the conditioning, and then we go to strength, and then after that, we go to experience. Do is my experience more? Well, is my experience much better than the guy that's that's attacking me? And it's kind of cool because I mean that went to self defense, and I like when you bring up numbers and like start telling me, hey, they've actually had inmates look at this video and they point them out. Who would you mug or who would you attack or you know who would you go for? And that's the stuff that I that definitely like I agree people should know because for me it's like hey people need to know all sorts what works and what doesn't work as well because I mean I used to be karate like you know because back in the 80s I would say from my experience people thought karate was a one all beat all yeah. and then MMA came in and then you're yeah. like oh shit what's this thing called jiu-jitsu so karate doesn't work uh, yeah, what yeah exactly like I used to be into like Bruce Lee or Kung Fu like hey I can do this crane pose and it's gonna kick anybody's ass yeah. not if they know rest the one wrestling yeah. and I, I mean I mean, I, I'm support, I support your business because it's something that definitely helps out everybody. I mean, I've been, like, well, as I say, so what got me into martial arts and my fitness journey was that sophomore year of high school, I was just walking to school and some random guy just came up and just punched in the back of hands, just started wailing on me, pushed me into the bush, and I was not fit, I was fat. The only, all I could do was just push him off, get away from him, and just, like, we had, like, about a six-foot difference uh six foot apart, uh, apart from each other and i just grabbed my nose and i was bleeding and I, I just made eye contact with him and then i just ran and thankfully the guy didn't pursue me and i just ran to my buddy's house who was literally right around the corner and that kind of was my awakening it's like you know what i don't like this feeling i don't like feeling helpless no. so i'm gonna have to start working out and learn how to fight and that's something that I my personal opinion is that there's all these whatever you believe in this is for people like you can have your right to believe in everything but don't take away the right to stuff for someone to defend themselves mm. because uh, the analogy I use is like I'm all for guns again this is my opinion all for guns like to defend myself and people say oh it's against the law it's against the law well it was against the law for that guy to physically assault me like that and he didn't listen and if someone said you can learn how to fight because it's not you don't have to worry about it i'm, I'm gonna want to learn how to fight yeah i want to learn how to defend myself because i went through that thankfully i it was nothing more worse than that but that kind of led me in journeys like i need to be fit i need to know how like you're saying have the conditioning i need to know what i can do to control manipulate the human body that because for me my my favorite is jujitsu i like jujitsu it's the one thing that i that i feel like i've kind of like gravitated a lot more towards to i haven't done it recently though that's another story but i did mma what got me into that i got in the cage and it's kind of that thing i forget of those things i remember like hey you have these skills but hey it makes you i didn't think about it like for self-defense also i was just wanting to do it because it made me feel superior it made me feel better about myself which and again i have a friend says like well it did do serve sort of that because it made you feel like you were up above a level above everybody else now because yeah. you had these skills and that's not a bad feeling knowing that you can be confident and know like when you teach me be situational and wish it, look at your exits look what's around how the area look around and i mean <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's what this whole this whole thing is about right so it's not Going to firearms classes, going to self-defense classes, or um, taking combative stuff like BJJ or whatever, it's it's not it's not about f- being better than everybody else. That's not what it's for. It's 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 for you to feel confident in your ability to protect yourself and your family. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, the people that that do it and are so bullheaded that they, they, they only do it because they want to be better than everybody else. They're the ones that don't stick with it, don't make it, or they're the ones that get hurt because they're, trying, they're, they're not as prepared as they thought they were. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it's the whole point of it, like I said, is, is to build your confidence and your ability to protect yourself, your family, friends, or others in bad situations. Mm-hmm. Um, so for you, I mean, it started off. You know, you like that feeling of you like you're better than them. Yeah, you're it was. Better, I will admit. Yeah, yeah, and that that is a feeling. You do feel like you're better than uh, people that don't do it. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily feeling like you're better than them. It's you feel more confident in your ability against them if something was to happen. Mm-hmm. 
So um, people people look at people that do all this training, and they're like, oh, they're just, you know, they're they're uh, trying to do that. They're trying to do this, or they're trying to feel like they're better than everybody else, or whatever. And no, I don't. I don't do all this stuff because I want to feel like I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. I do all this stuff because I want to make sure if something was to happen, like civil unrest, mm -hmm. that I stand a pretty good chance of protecting myself and my family. And that is a pretty high probability nowadays, yeah. yeah. Civil unrest, yeah. Yeah, and uh, people, people, sometimes it's just ignorance, mm -hmm. um, but most of the time it's just fear, Yeah. Um, right? They, people are afraid to do something they're not used to doing. You know, take your typical uh, female, Population when it comes to self-defense stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that they don't want to do it. It's not necessarily that they Think they're gonna be they, they don't want to think that they're better than everybody else or you know, whatever It's the fear of doing it because they've never done it mm -hmm. and 99.9% uh, 99, 99 .9 of the time if they just say screw your fear and do it like we talked about yeah They come out of that pretty freaking happy and confident that mm -hmm. they did it. Mm -hmm. And that just opens the door for more stuff. Um, come, up, come with a, an attitude of willing to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, fear is a learned skill, right? So. Yeah, you remember telling me that. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, you're not born with the fear of water. You know, people are born with the fear of falling, the fear of loud noises. Um, you're not born with the fear of water. You're not born with a fear of taking a course. Um, those fears can be broken. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you hear you hear it all the time when people are say they're you know they're afraid of water. P you hear this all the time in boot camp. Guys are f you know afraid of water, um, and you got to do swim qual, and then they're tossed into the water by the drill instructors, and guess what? They pass. They're not afraid of water anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, fear is a learned skill. You're you you learn to be afraid of water. You learn to be afraid of going outside your comfort zone. You learn to be afraid of public speaking, but they can all be broken, mm -hmm. just like anything else. And part of that is um, on you is, like I said before, when you're most afraid to do something, you need to do it. Mm -hmm. Be smart about it. Obviously, if something's dangerous, you don't want to just say, you know, Send it and just jump into right. you know shark infested waters mm -hmm. because you're afraid of it. And you know Damon said, uh, if you're afraid of it, do it. You know, <laughs> be smart about it. Yeah. You know, get professional help and get in the cage with sharks or get professional scuba divers and go swimming with them. Do your and research. You know, do your research. You know, be smart about it. But if you're afraid of something, that's when you need to do it. And you know, that's how you break those it's those sad. those built fears. Those it's a skill. To break that. That's that thing that you always hear, like, we know what we don't know, so if we start understanding what we don't know, we ha we're less afraid of it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's funny, because I used to, I said this one time, it was a stupid thing, I think when I was young, because, like, bears, people are afraid of bears, and I was like, yeah, I would be scared to face a bear, but then I was thinking, like, hey, I'm up and read a bear, what if I try to go hunt a bear? <laughs> so yeah. to get over that fear, but I mean, not that extent, but, like, know that, how dangerous a bear is. But it's not, a, it's bears. not, you know, if you're afraid of bears, you want to go hunt bears, you get over it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, don't go by yourself. Yeah, and understand that they're <laughs> right? dangerous animals. Understand, animal. yeah, the precautions it takes to hunt a bear, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I'm not afraid of bears. I love bears, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to go up and hug a bear. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because that's stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm asking to be killed at mm -hmm. that point or seriously mm -hmm. injured. Mm -hmm. um, so it's you know. The same thing is like, you know, talking about don't be stupid. You know, if you're afraid of bears, okay, why are you afraid of them? What's your reasoning? Well, okay, you know, go, in your case, go hunt a bear. Mm -hmm. But don't go by yourself. You right. know, go with somebody that knows what they're doing, know how to use tree stands, know how to, you know, what to look for. Um, understand know bear's how far behavior. You, you yeah. know, understand bear's behavior. Know how far you're supposed to stay away. You know how to shoot a gun, obviously. Right. Um, you know, have precautions uh, such as spray or whatever to help. You know, keep them away. Um, but you're not just going to go out and hunt a bear by yourself. Right. That you're just asking to get hurt. Um, so plan for failure or something like yeah. that. Yeah.
Fear is something you've, st- and it sounds like, I mean, you've studied fear, huh? Like, have you gone down really deep and studied it, mm-hmm. huh? Yeah. Like, what's something that you found interesting about fear? I mean, I don't know if you ever reset it, though, but, like, you something need it. to do it. Um, you need to be afraid. If you're not afraid, that's when you get hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, the same, it's the same thing when you think about, um, for, for your instance, competitions. Mm-hmm. Right? You go into a competition, you go into a workout, you're getting ready to do a workout, what do you get? Uh, the uh, like uh, anxiety, the like shakes, like anxiety, doubt. shakes. I'm, Nerv- I'm going through everything. I nervousness, been through. Yes, nervousness, doubt, fear. Yeah, like am I good enough? Yeah. All these all these hours I've been into the gym. Are they going to add up to it? Okay, so I'm trying to go through the checklist. Yeah. What did I do right? What's not going to work? Well, what do you what do you because you're going through that? Mm-hmm. You're more likely to. If you have a plan for that workout, you're more likely to follow that plan. Mm-hmm. But if you go into a workout and it's like, you know, whatever, you're not nervous, you're not scared. One, you don't love it. Two, you're probably going to do something stupid. Mm-hmm. You're going to go out way too hard. Or you're not going to go out, you know, hard enough because you're not excited for it. Um, and fear, fear is the same way. If, if I was going on a patrol, and I didn't have a fear of stepping on an ID. Mm-hmm. Well, my ID detection and sweeping would probably be pretty piss poor. Yeah, because I'm not worried about stepping on it. I'm not afraid of it, right? Right. And that's called complacency. Nah, uh, yeah. Complacency Damn. kills. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, in in that case, complacency can kill you, because and you know, a lot of people struggle with it when, especially when they've been over there for a while, and it's it's day to day and a day, and we're in firefights every day and we're always looking for IDs and uh, it was it's a battle to not get complacent and understand that you can still die today Mm -hmm. Um, so having that fear of I don't want to die is needed because if it's not there then you're not going to care about dying Mm -hmm. and you're going to step on that ID because you're not looking as intently as you would if you were afraid yeah Right. Um, I heard that kind of say like that complacency as well with um, one of my old jobs we were talking about. We, I worked in a ring warehouse and, you know, there's equipment like you cut your hand, so and so. And we talked about complacency. And the example they sh- they talked to us was about a uh, I don't know. It's a guy that like at a train yard, make sure everything's good on the cars, the tracks and everything. And they gave us the, they gave us the question, like, who do you think is more likely to die from getting run over by a train car the new guy or the guy that's been working there for 10 years we kind of already knew it was like the guy with that's been there for 10 years and they're like why because complacency he's been there for 10 years he goes through his route he doesn't look for it anymore to make sure the safety checks and they're more probable to die because like you said they're not there they got used to it that like yep. they're not looking for the warning signs like hey watch out this train's coming or hey i got my leg stuck here you know, so yeah, complacency's a bitch. Yep. And you know, that's I mean that's that's all fear is is your ability to recognize that um, you need to be aware of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, can that be confused with paranoia though? Like it can be. I mean, obviously you can be too afraid, right? Now you're now you're just being like paranoid. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a whole different issue in itself. That's a whole psychological issue in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but a healthy dose of fear is something everybody needs. Because, um, yeah, like another guy I listened to, this guy's name, Ed uh, Calderon. I don't know if you know him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He talks about that for him, he thinks paranoia is, paranoia is good. But, it, but he says it depends on what priority is your paranoia on. Mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing wrong with being paranoid, making sure, hey, be aware of your surroundings. Hey, hey, it, and he he doesn't even mean like psychological paranoia. Mm-hmm. He's talking about like paranoia and the fact that you're you're alert mm-hmm. and you know you're aware, you're alert, you know what's going on. Um, so you don't. If you're paranoid in that aspect, then you're not going to worry about being complacent because you're always looking, you're always alert, you're always on 
uh, there's a scale, you know, white, yellow, red, right? Mm -hmm. And alertness, basically, depending on the situation, it's not, maybe it's not a bad thing to be red or paranoid all the time. Like an example, you go to a concert where there's a crap load of people that you don't know what, uh, what variable could happen out there, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you, want, you want to enjoy, if you want to enjoy yourself at the concert, but you also want to be extremely aware of what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. That um, you don't want to be so aware on the psychological side and paranoia of that you can't even enjoy yourself at the concert because yeah. you're too afraid of what some you know so and so on the left and right of you is doing, mm -hmm. or that you know somebody's going to be uh, off somewhere, you know, hiding up in a hotel like the Las Vegas shooting. Right, right, right. I mean, if you go to every concert and there's buildings around you and you're so paranoid that somebody's going to be up in those hotels getting ready to shoot you. That's a psychological paranoia. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah. You can't even enjoy yourself because you're too alert and too aware and too worried about what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So being paranoid in the aspect of I'm just on alert more than most people. Mm -hmm. That would be considered paranoia to most people, right? Yeah. Because um, I'm trying to think about it. Like when I when, out, I, you know, when I talk about self defense stuff in the videos, you know, there's a lot of people that comment, you know, paranoid, paranoid. You now when they say more fruitful stuff. But it, it's all like being paranoid and being uh, a weirdo, right? Because you're, you're, you're alert. You're alert and you know what's going on and you're prepared. But people see that, that don't have any experience with it as paranoia. Yeah. And so. that's it's interesting because it's, I feel like I always kind of try to give them also the benefit of the doubt, though, because they haven't experienced yeah. some of the stuff we've been through. And it's like, it, it happens. They just don't like, know. They they don't know. Better. Yeah, and that's the one thing. I mean, being with my girlfriend now is, she's li she definitely is a little more, like, how do I say, carefree than mm -hmm. me. Like, make sure I lock the door before we go to bed. Uh, make sure everything's good. Like, hey, what's, uh, there's a guy over there. Like, And she, sometimes she's just like, you're a little paranoid. I was like, it's just making sure. I mean, I it's, I told you this, my philosophy is always better to, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, make sure, like, or one tip I found out with, like, the door hinges, uh, take out the screws in there and use some, like, d uh, deck screws, the longer screws, because it makes it harder for someone to break in. Yeah, it makes those. it harder to break in because now your screws are going into deeper in the frame yeah and that's yeah. something that i was like I'm do i've done and i'm like hey and why are you doing that so it's like you just never know especially mm -hmm. like going from where we or like where turning, we live turning your blinds and yeah like even going into um where we used to live in den yeah den's getting bigger but now that i'm living in dallas i just see a lot more more crowd more population of people so i see a lot more stuff and it's just like sometimes i'm like damn like i understand why i would love want to live in the country i don't want to deal with people but now i'm in this different environment i need to know how the, to traverse this environment to make sure hey i like you were saying at the beginning of your thing protect my my the, that person i care about make sure we can enjoy ourselves and if anything arises that i have the skill set to protect her and myself because i mean i remember when i was taking a course with you i told you one of the situations was i don't own a gun too that's the thing about me i, I i'm over four guns but i don't own a gun but we were at pumping gas at a state at a gas station uh, I told her, hey, don't worry, stay in the car, I'll pump the gas. And I start seeing this, oh, I see this suspicious guy I told you about. He was, like, taking pictures of the gas station, like, weird. And this was, like, a cholo-looking guy. Cholo, like, had the wife beater, the jean shorts. Top button flannel. Yeah, and it was just, like, he had the mustache, shaved <laughs> head. High socks. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And, and, and I was just like, okay, first of all, like, this just, like, no one just keep an eye on me. That's, like, suspicious. Why are you doing that? Yeah. Um, but he apparently he had taken a picture in our area, in our direction where we were parked on the pump side. And my girlfriend goes, hey, babe, like he took a picture of our car. I'm like, what? Yeah, he took a picture of our car. And I was just keeping my eye on him. And all of a sudden he's on the side. And then this other guy approaches him and he said, he apparently took a picture of his car too. And this guy, gentleman says like, hey, what the fuck are you doing? And I was in the guy, I don't know what it was. All I heard was a, like, hey, if you don't stop this, I'm going to go open my trunk and pull out the gun and just pop you. And sure enough, I was like, you know what? I can't want to be for that shit to happen. It may seem cowardly, but I don't give a fuck. I got my girlfriend here. Let's stop pumping. Let's go to another gas station and not be a part of this situation, this uh, yeah. shit show that's that could in, in, turn out. 
or happened. So I feel like that's one of the reasons I feel like I don't really regret it because as there's a I'm trying to differentiate because I always like want to say like I didn't want to go in there like John Wayne, but there's also a point where I'm like, hey, I well, got to consider someone that gotta, I care about. You got to think, right? Mm -hmm. So you brought up the word cowardly. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be cowardly, but you know you wanted to get out of there, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, you know, I've I, you've been to you've helped me with a lot of my courses. You've been to a couple. It's you know, there's one thing I say in every single one of them, and that is, you know, every single one of you is 100% easy to kill. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about statistics, you know, and I bring up the statistic of every single one of you, including myself, we're all 100% easy to kill. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to kill me when you walked in that door, you could have because I wasn't ready for it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting it because you had the element of surprise, right? Well... I mean, you got to think about that in any situation. So, if you're, if you're, if I'm with my wife and my two sons, my son's six month old, my son's 24 month old, um, soon to be 25, 25 month old, um, and we're going out to eat, and something happens across the street, it doesn't even have to be associated with me. Me, as a protector, I would normally look for something I could do, right? So, say, for instance, somebody is getting, there's no gun involved, there's no weapon involved, mm -hmm. somebody's getting mugged, getting the purse taken, very basic situation, right? Somebody's getting mugged, getting the purse taken, um, and there's a threat over there, right? So yeah. my, my instinct is to help, mm -hmm. but, what what do I do? I can't do that if I'm with my wife and my kids. So I got to think. Well, what, what's the point of me going over there and putting myself in harm's way if my I'm just leaving my wife and kids to fend for themselves? Mm -hmm. That's that's not okay, right? So at that point, it's not being cowardly. You were with your girlfriend, right? Yeah. So my best option would be just to get my wife and kids to safety mm -hmm. out of that situation. Your best option when that came up was to get your girlfriend and yourself to safety. Um, the same reason when we talk about uh, if somebody attacks you with a, a knife or attacks you in general, your best option might just to be run away. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's not being cowardly. That's not, you know, be, me being a pussy. <laughs> that's me not wanting to get hurt. Mm -hmm. That's me making making sure that I get home to my wife and kids. Yeah. Because if I, you know, you can have an ego battle with somebody all you want, and it may just start out as a hand-to-hand -hand confrontation, but if you have an ego battle with this person, say I'm by myself, and um, I'm getting into an argument or a confrontation with this person, well, maybe I come out on top and hurt him. Well, he had a gun on him. Yeah. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. He decides to use it after I get the upper hand. Now where does that put me? Yeah, six foot it puts under, me about yeah. six foot, foot six foot under, yeah. and now my wife and kids are left without a you know a husband and a father. Yeah. yeah. So you have to take those things into consideration. Like, is there is your best course of action to be that protector? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, it probably is. You validate school shooting. Yeah, it's probably your best interest. You know, if if whether you have a wife or kids or not, and you're a police officer to get your ass in the building and save those kids and teachers and faculty, mm -hmm. right? Somebody is in there killing children. You need to get your ass in there and take care of the threat. Mm -hmm. Get three to four guys, go in there as a team and take care of them. Um, somebody's getting mugged across the street. I got my wife and kids with me. Probably not my issue. Yeah. I need to worry about my family. If I can do something, I would. But with my wife and kids with me, I need to leave. Top priority, yeah. Um, yeah. So you gotta you gotta think about those situations and what's what's priority, right? Um, what's smart? Um, and you know, if you make a decision, you have to stick with it, and it may not be the right decision, but you made it, and that's what you need to live with. So it, yeah, and and you would say you would. Uh, that's why I know if taking your courses too. It's always good to train under stress 
Yeah. The one thing, like, I mean, you remember, I'm like, you're a tactical games athlete. So you're putting, going through a workout and then shooting targets, yeah. training your body to be able to know what to do when it's under stress. That's, you would recommend that for anybody else. Like, if they'd be a responsible gun owner, go to the range and not just maybe shoot targets, but like do a couple of push ups and then try to shoot the target. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that goes with, uh, should go without saying as far as like, if you, you know, all your fine motor skills go when stress is through the roof, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I train, and I, I train to do these hard workouts and shoot accurately under, you know, high stress, competition stress, and high heart rate, but that level of stress and my life or somebody else's life is on the line stress is two completely different stressors, mm, Okay. right? Yeah. So I, I can train all I want to work out good and shoot good, mm -hmm. but when it comes down to my life is on the line, it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it, it's good to do that. I mean, if you have any kind of stress you can implement to get your heart rate up, breathing heavy, and still shoot under pressure, that helps you overall. But then you also need to do things such as combatives, firearms courses. Mm -hmm. Like you need somebody to punch you in the face and then go do something with a firearm to understand um, that kind of stress level. It's yeah. still not the same because you're still not, you know you're not fighting for your life, but it's much different than just doing a couple burpees and shooting. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, I'm working on putting courses together like that and um, there is courses out there like that that you know force on force training where you're um, fighting people in the course to an extent um, but it's 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 meant to get hands on you it's control meant to the get, environment yeah, it's yeah. meant to control the environment it's meant to uh, learn how to control an opponent or learn how to control the weapon of the opponent yeah. or um, moving through a home and having somebody shoot back at you with BBs or uh, pellets or whatever they're using or sim rounds uh, in the course um, so you get the feeling of oh hey I screwed up took the corner too sharply or took the corner too wide or didn't paint it good enough and I get shot because of it well that's a learning curve right right but if you don't have that and you don't go to stuff like that then you never get that you can clear a house all day by yourself you know whatever but it's not until you clear a house with people shooting back at you that it's a little different yeah um, and, and, you know, that's something I learned early on when I was in the military doing uh, stuff overseas is, you know, when we're doing clearing of villages, um, I remember multiple times of, you know, we've done lots and lots of training on, you know, room clearing and uh, working as a team and doing, you know, urban breaching and uh, uh, using breaching demolitions, you mm -hmm. know, all this stuff and clearing stuff. But it wasn't until, you know, the first time kicking in the door and seeing someone directly in front of you that it kicks in like, you know, doesn't matter how many times you clear a house until you experience it with people fighting you. That's a different thing. Luckily, it was, you know, a kid that was on the other side of the door when I kicked it in and nothing happened. But um, if it was a bad guy, that'd be a different story. Yeah. Right. So. Um, it's it's there's different stressors and you have to you have to practice with all with you know both of them and really my and, uh, I believe there's only two stressors and that's the regular training stressor like burpees and shooting and then there's the I'm getting punched in the face and shooting um, type stuff so best bet best course of action train both as much as you can that way when it actually happens, you're at least more well-rounded and more ready to uh, deal with that situation. Awesome. And then, I mean, it's the same with firefighting, right? So yeah. as a firefighter, we're, you know, we can't just become a firefighter and expect to go into a burning building and, you know, put the fire out. Um, but we go to training where there's a training tower and there's um, people that are trained to create fire in the building and we have to put the fire out. But it gives us that training stress of, my life is on the line, there's fire, um, I'm fighting actual fire, and I'm putting it out. 
and that way you get accustomed to that. So when you go into an actual fire where your life is actually on the line, you're more prepared to deal with it. And so the same thing applies to self-defense. If I'm fighting somebody force on force and then having to deal with them and then go shoot something, well, that's the same thing that's gonna happen if I'm fighting somebody in the streets trying to mug me mm -hmm. and I'm fighting for a weapon and I can get, it, get away, make distance, and then put rounds on them. It's the same concept. It's, yeah. it's a different stress, but it's closely related to what I've been training. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, being able to train that is the best thing you can do as far as preparing yourself for those kind of situations. You'll never prepare yourself for the actual situation. It doesn't matter what you do, but you can get close to what it's going to be like, depending on what kind of training you go to. So. Well, I think that's a great spot to end this, man. I mean, I know it's an hour. It's an hour 34. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, you probably got to get going. I know I told you an hour, but that's a great spot to end this. So here's, we'll, we'll end it. I want to closing this video audio thing for everybody. This is something I ask everybody. Uh, what, If anything, what do you want people to take out of this? What's something that you want people to know? That, like, maybe a piece of advice or some insight. I would say just understand that life is pre human life is, pre is precious and to not be afraid to go out of your comfort zone. There, there's, like I said in the beginning, there's too many people that are afraid to do stuff that they want to do or need to do because they're afraid of what people might think or, you know, whatever. Um, just understand that when you're most afraid to do something, that's when you need to do it. That's how you grow. Um, Success comes from failure. So if you don't, if you're too afraid to try it and fail, then you're never going to progress. You're never going to grow. You're never going to become the person you want to be because you never failed. Um, and it's becoming more prevalent in the society as people that are getting everything handed to them, right? Mm -hmm. um, but don't be that person. If you're, you know, if you're scared to attend a course, understand that if you've done your research properly and you're going to a good instructor that they're going to make sure you have a good time, you're going to be safe, and you're going to be taken care of, but you're also going to learn. So don't be afraid to go take that course, learn, become more confident, and it's going to open the world up for you as far as taking other stuff because now you're not as afraid to do it. Um, so just understand that fear is, you know, fear is a learned skill. It can be broken just like anything else. It just takes you know, constant action on your part to go outside your comfort zone fail 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 so you su so you can succeed succeed and succeed um if you don't fail you're not going to succeed all right well i'm there